changes to the formula class from PS2. And I'm going to have you make some changes to the dependency graph class that you're doing right now. So it's your chance to get both those classes, you know, fix any problem that you have and make these extensions before PS5 when you'll be using both those classes in a spreadsheet. So I'll be releasing the grading tests for, for PS3 before, or probably like on Saturday. Uh, so you can, even well before they're actually graded, so you can uh, use them in PS4. Okay, so that's where we're headed. Yes? For the submission, uh, it says provide the short hash code for the commit that you want to play. Mm -hmm. So is that the, the next six digit code on GitHub when you, when you say you need this commit? Yeah, so every, every commit that you create has a hash. And it's yay long. And I just, GitHub and the Visual Studio plugin both display. One of them displays the first seven digits, the other the first eight digits. Either one's okay. So when you, essentially when you create a, um, a commit, git hashes it and uh, gets that hash code and when you push it to GitHub, it's the same hash on GitHub. So it pretty much uniquely identifies a, a commit. So I know that if you submit the hash on, you know, before midnight, it really doesn't matter what, what time the, the commits push to get up because we can tell if it was, you, know, you can't forge the hash. Anything else? All right, now, let me tell you what's going to happen is tomorrow, or, or not to, well, when you, whenever you start working on PS3, or PS4 rather, you're going to want to pull down migrating tests. And let me explain how that's going to work. So this is a view of the state of PS2 branch when you pulled it to start working on PS2. So I gave you, uh, you know, there's the spreadsheet folder, there's the formula. I gave you formula class to start with. I gave you formula simple tests. I don't know what packages is. That's maybe a mistake I made making the slides. There's a solution file for, for the spreadsheet solution. You know, and if we opened up those folders, formula and formula simple tests, you'd find, uh, you know, a CS proj file for each, because that's a project, you'd find the .cs files. You'd find various pieces of information. So you clone the, you, you pull down this PS2 branch into your local copy of the spreadsheet repository and made changes to it. So what did you do? You, open, you, know, you went to the formula project, or I should point here, you went into the formula project and you edited the formula.cs file. You, uh, you may have created some test cases of your own and created a project and it contains that. Maybe you went into this file and modified it. And you do that project and modify the file. Um, so you made changes to it. At the same time you were doing that, I was modifying my version. So now the version on GitHub, if you, pull, if you look at PS2, it's going to have a new project, PS2 grading tests. So what is it that you want to do? This is the, your latest commit on your laptop or whatever. That's my latest commit on GitHub. So if you want to run the grading test, what do you have to do? You've got to pull that, that commit down and since we both made changes, it's going to have to be merged. So when you, when you go and pull, and I'll show you in a second, when you go and pull from the remote repo, it'll merge them together to produce this. Now, is it, will you have to get involved in the merge, or will it be automatic? Let's think about the changes that are made. You added my test cases here. Okay. Is that going to be a problem when you merge that with that? No, because you've got my test cases, I don't. So, you know, you can go back here and you can see, okay, this is where we were. This is the only place my test cases were added, so it's just copied over, no problem. I added grading tests, PS2 grading tests. And that's just copied down, because there's no conflict. But there is at least one conflict here, nonetheless. 
what is the conflict that you'll have to mediate? Is it the changes to the spreadsheet? That's what right. It's the changes to spreadsheet.sln, that configuration file. Because that configuration file contains uh, information about the solution, and one piece of information it has is, a, is the, uh, uh, the address on disk, the path name, to each of the projects. And so your, your uh, solution, uh, spreadsheet at LSLN file contains references to formula, formula simple test, and my test cases. Mine has references to formula, form, formula simple test, and PS2 grading tests. And so that, they're different versions of the same file. They have to be merged, and that'll take some intervention to decide how to merge them. Now, it's also possible that you'll find yourself having to merge formula.cs, depending on when you, when you pulled my project, because I originally had a, a mistaken formula.cs that I changed. And so if you have an old copy of formula.cs for this, you, if you branched earlier, in other words, and then you made changes to it, you may have to merge those as well. But all of you, I think, as long as you added a, a new project, you're going to have to merge the solution files. So let me show you how that's done. You know, there's no need to freak out when it asks you to do merging. You just have to expect, it's just the cost of doing business. So here I have a repository called My Spreadsheet. So this is meant to be kind of like, you know, your project on your computer. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Sync. Well, first of all, I'm going to go to Settings and make sure that I'm pulling from the remote repo. So yeah, you can see I'm fetching from uh, the spreadsheet, the remote spre spreadsheet repo. So that's good. Now I'm going to go and uh, go to Sync, and it says there's one incoming commit. And you can see the comment right there. It says, add PS2 grading tests. So that's the, my, the commit I created when I added the grading test. Now, you may not see incoming commits. It may not know about the incoming commits if you just change the remote. In that case, you just got to come down. You, you got to go fetch. OK? Now, also notice that I have outgoing commits. Those are the test cases, you know, modeling the test cases you have added. So let's just do the pull. See what happens. Okay, so what it's saying up there in yellow, it's kind of small, it says pull completed with conflicts, resolve the conflicts and commit the results. Okay, so all you have to do is click, it says resolve the conflicts, you click. And what it shows you now are all the files that are in conflict. And it's showing you that there's just one conflict, it's between the two versions of spreadsheet.sln. So uh, let's click on that and click on Merge. Well, first I'll show you another option. <clears throat> All right, you've got your choice. You can click on Merge, and you go into the Merge process. You can click, uh, down at the bottom it says Take Remote. What do you suppose would happen if I clicked on Take Remote? Yeah? All right, it'll use this, this, the, it'll just use the SLN file from my remote repo. If I click Keep Local, it'll just use the version on my computer. Neither one is right. If I keep the remote, when I open the solution, I'm not going to see the, my test cases. And if I keep the local, I'm not going to see the graded test cases. They'll still be there. The projects will be in there. And you can, if you want to, then add them in, back in. It's not like all is lost. But let's see how to actually do a merge. So typically, you've got to do a merge. So you click on Merge. And you get this thing pops up. In this case, it's a configuration file, which is kind of weird to look at, which is why a lot of students sort of run screaming from this, because they don't understand what they're seeing. But over here is one version. I forget if this is the remote or the local. Let's see this. OK, this is the remote version of spreadsheet on SLM, side by side with your version. And down here is where you're going to create the merged version. And if you're merging uh, code, you would have two programs on your side. So it's highlighted one way they differ. This one, it says, let me get the font a little bigger. OK. This says uh, project, blah, 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 PS2 grading test. So that's the 
That's an entry in the spreadsheet.sln file that refers to the, to the PS2 grading test. In the same spot in your version, is it says project, blah, 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 my test cases. So, and down here, it just has a blank spot. You've got to decide what to put in this blank spot. So, of those two things up there, which should we copy down? Both. So I'm going to tick there to copy that down. I'm going to tick there to copy that down. Now, this result file down here has references to all the projects. Okay, that's easy. And then I can go on, let's see up here, I can go to next difference. So I'll click there. And now it's showing me this stuff. I don't even know what this stuff is. It's some sort of settings for the different projects. And I just learned that when you're, when you're merging SLM files, just take them both. Okay? And now it's got the, the result is down here. So when you're happy with the result, you say, up here is a button that says accept merge. So I'll accept the merge. And now we're back over here. And it says there are no remaining conflicts. And all that remains is to click commit merge. When you click commit merge, commit merge you'll create a commit of the merged file. So what do you think you should do next? Run it. Make sure, you don't have to click commit right now. You can do the commit later. My recommendation is, forget about committing the merge. Make sure you didn't screw up. Then, if you screwed up, you can abort and try the merge again. And if you did the right thing, you can always commit. So try things out. So let's go, let's go and see if it looks good. So I'll go here, I'll open spreadsheet.sln. I'll look in the solution explorer, and you'll see I have formula, formula simple tests, my test cases, PS2 grading tests, they're all there. And I could open them up and look at it and run the test cases, whatever, to make sure that everything got copied over okay. And once I'm satisfied, I've got to go find that little, uh, I could just go to the commit merge right here. Or I suppose I could just go to the, to the uh, sync one. Uh, the changes place and do the merge there, but I'll just do the commit merge. And it, uh, yeah, it puts me here to commit it. I say uh, merging, and then I, I create the commit just like usual. And if I decide, no, this isn't working out, I, 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 don't, I forget where the abort button is. We can always come to, in, in Visual Studio, just come back, right click on the solution and click undo. And that will undo everything since the last commit. So, I'll undo, so that just ended all the merge. Every, you know, that, that undid the merge that way too. So when you got a merge, just take your time. Think about what you're doing. And after you're done, don't commit until you're sure you did the right thing. If you did the wrong thing, abort it and try again. Okay? Any questions about that? This will become more and more common. Uh, like for PS5, you're going to have to merge your, essentially, your PS2 and PS3 branches together <coughs> to get a PS5. And um, that's a different kind of merging. That's merging two branches. Here we're just we're merging changes on the same branch from two different places. All right, so I will... Start a count now and see how many times the next week on Piazza I'm asked the question of what we're supposed to do when this pops up. Because I've never, I, I've never spent this much time explaining merging. I decided it'd be a good idea. In the past, it was just every other question was about this merge thing. So we'll see. Okay. So last time we were talking about regular expressions. So I want to repeat. I'm sort of hurrying at the end. Uh, so let's just remember what we talked about last time. A, a regular expression is a way of describing patterns. And so the first thing you have to learn is how to describe patterns. And we saw that uh, there's the simplest kind of pattern is just plain text, and that'll match that plain text. You can use vertical bars for alternatives. So this says this will match the string this or is or uh, or test. You can use parentheses for grouping. So that said, DO or FA or HA or JO followed by T, so it'll match any of those strings. We saw these character sets, which is a shorter way of saying D or F or H or J followed by OE. Character ranges, lowercase a through z, followed by a, lower, by a one through nine. 
This is like a character set, except it says everything but. So this will match any character other than ABC. Uh, same deal going on there. Okay? So that was, that's sort of the basics. And then we saw these uh, repetition operations. So question mark means optional. The thing that comes before it is optional. Star means zero or more repetitions. And plus means one or more repetitions. So for example, <coughs> zero, five, plus one means a zero followed by one or more fives followed by a one. So it matches all these strings here. Right? That's the, you, know, you can delve deeper and deeper into this and learn more and more details, but uh, you got a good working set right now. All right, and this is a slide I didn't do last time. Remember last time I was having trouble with the decimal point in my, in my uh, numbers. The reason was I would forgotten that, that that period is a special character. It matches any character. So the, the pattern A dot B would match any three-letter sequence that you know, begins with A and ends with a B. And so what should I have done to make the dot work? I meant the dot to actually match dot. What, did I, what should I have done? Yeah. Escape it. Escape it. I should have had a backslash in front of it to, to neuter its special properties and just make it be a dot. Okay. There are other special characters, like caret matches the beginning of the line or the beginning of the input, depending on what mode you're working in, and dollar matches the end. So let's say you want to match an entire string, you've got to put caret at the beginning and dollar sign at the end if you want to match the pattern against the entire string and not just a piece of it. You know, there's new line, this is any white space character, this is any non-white space character, that's any digit, that's any non-digit. So, those are all details. And when I write regular expressions, I, you know, I often have to look up the syntax because I don't remember. But, you know, you do this enough, you get used to it. And, like I said last time, a good way to learn how to write patterns is to go to a place like regex101.com and just try it out. Try writing patterns and see what you can do. And if you're writing a pattern for putting in a program, much better to debug your pattern on regex101 and then stick it in your program. <coughs> debug your pattern, stick it in the program, instead of putting the pattern in the program and then trying to debug it as the program runs. Just uh, a lot easier to try it out online. OK, so those three tables tell you a lot about regular expressions. Before I go any further, I want to see if there are any questions I can answer. This next assignment, PS4, is going to involve some regular expressions. So. Rather answer them now than on Piazza multiple times. <laughs> yeah? So I was looking through the code that you had for this formula for parsing through, and I noticed there were multiple different classes that you used uh, when implementing the regular expressions, because you had like three different regular expressions and pattern matching them. And so right. So what you're asking about is what classes specifically do you use? How, how, you, how do you do it in C Sharp? Yeah. Right. So what I've just told you, what I've do, done with these three tables, is what you need to use regular expressions in C Sharp or Java or C or C++ or Python or whatever. So in all those languages, you've got to write the pattern. And except for really minor details, it's the same in all the languages. But then to actually do something with them in a program, that's specific to the language. So what I, I haven't finished telling you about regular expressions. Next step is to show you how to actually embed them in a program. Okay, anything before I proceed to that step? Okay, I do want to look at a couple of examples. So this is social security number. So that says three backslash D and then three. What's that mean? Three digits. Any three digits followed by a hyphen, followed by two digits, followed by four digits. So that's the social security number. This is like an American you know, phone number, US phone number. So what's it saying in specific? It looks kind of complicated. What if we just look at what's to the right side of my hand there? What's that say a phone number is? It has to be a two through nine, any digit, any digit. Okay, so a, a digit, two through nine. So it turns out that this is the six-digit, the seven-digit part of the phone number, the local number. 
Local number can't start with a zero or one. So it's two through nine, digit, digit, hyphen, four digits. So that's the back. The front end is to deal with the three-digit area code. So this describes a three-digit area code. What happens when I put a question mark after it? Optional. Makes it optional. So the area code's optional. And then I said, uh, let's see, it, what's this here? Backslash parenthesis. So I wanted, I want my area code to be in parentheses. So I had to say literally backslash. I don't want to, usually it's a special character that's used for grouping. So I say I want a literal a parenthesis, and here's the closing literal parenthesis. And in between, I got the same deal. Two through nine and two more digits. And then finally, what's here? Space. Optional space. So you can put a space, um, put a space after the area code or not, as you see fit. So you know, that took me some trial and error to get it right. Right? And this is sort of a sloppy attempt at an email address. So backslash w is what's called a word character. And a word character is roughly, you know, digits and letters. It's, uh, punctuation is not word, word characters. White space are not word characters. So anyway, what's that say? Backslash w plus. One or more, a sequence of one or more word characters. So it'd be like the first part of an email address. And then an at sign. And then, what's in these parentheses right here? So we'll call that a word. One or more word characters is a word. So you've got a word followed by what? A dot. And then you've got one or more of these. So you could be like A dot, or it could be A dot, B dot, or A, B, C dot, D, E, F dot. And then followed by a word. So that just gets all the, you know, why didn't I just say, why did I put this on here? Why, why, why could I just stop with the plus right there? Yeah. Yeah, there has to be at least a dot. You know, I've never seen an email address that's just someone at something. It has to be something dot com or dot edu. And furthermore, uh, it's I, I, this you can't end in a dot, right? The dot's between the words, not after the words. This is a trick for getting it in between. So word dot, repeat this as many times as we want, word dot, word dot, and then we just end with a word. So that's a regular expression that would match an email address. Okay, so he mentioned that there are lots of classes I was using. So the namespace you have to use is system.text.regular expressions. There is a um, class called regex. So to create a regex, you just take one of those strings and pass it to the regex constructor. Um, just take that pattern, debug it, and then copy it and paste it into your program. Now there's a problem when you copy and paste it into your program. What would happen if we took this thing here, slap quote marks around it, and pass, oops, Pass that as a first parameter of the regex constructor. Yeah? Do we have the dictate characters on there? Right. Now we got a problem. So imagine putting quote marks around this. The C sharp compiler is going to see this backslash w and say, what's backslash w? That's not a thing. And it'll complain. Uh, backslash dot. It's not going to like that. So there's two ways you can you can solve the problem. One is you can escape the escape characters. Yeah. So you could put slash slash w, slash slash w. And I've had situations where I had a, a regular expression when I did that that was, it ended up being, there were two slashes. I meant, I went put backslash, backslash in my regex because I meant a back, I literally meant backslash. And then when I put it into my Java code, I had to do, escape each of those. So I get backslash, 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 backslash. <laughs> okay, and that's a pain. But there's an easier way. Who knows the easier way to avoid this? Yeah. The at sign. So if what you do is put quote marks around the string, and then put an at sign here before the first quote mark. Then it, it it's basically saying, take this literally. Don't try to interpret the backslashes as escapes. Okay. So that's what that's what you do in C sharp. Java doesn't give you that option. That's why you'll see string literals again with an at sign, at sign quotation mark, so that you can 
you don't have to escape the, the uh, escape characters, escape the regex escapes. Okay, so we got a regex. Once you have a regex object, you can do various things. Like you can say, does this match the regex? Or you can ask, uh, attempt to match the regex against this text and tell me about the match. Now keep in mind, when you ask, is it a match? We're asking, does, this, does the regex match? Let's say the regex was just a character x. Would, the, would that regex match the string? It doesn't match the entire string, but it matches a piece of it, which is what regexes do. So uh, just keep in mind that. This will tell you about the match. This would give you back a collection of matches. <coughs> this is something that I used, I think, in, the, uh, in PS2 to split strings into tokens. I used the <coughs> regex to split. So we'll see examples of that in action, of these things. But those are some of the classes you'll see. So let's, uh, let's dive into C-sharp and see what's up. All right, here we go. I'm going to look at this main method here. Looks like I wrote this example before. Oh, yeah, there's an S on. Okay? So for, look at the first two things. There's two ways to create an identifier regex. What's different about them? So by identifier, I mean uh, any, any sequence of letters and digits. Of, of, of any sequence of at least one letter in digit. The top one will take the capital letters. Okay, so the top one is explicitly saying the first character has to be a letter, and it can be either lowercase or uppercase. Bottom one doesn't mention uppercase. Yeah? But presumably the regex options that ignore case allows it to also take in uppercase. Right. So you can pass in as a second parameter options that sort of customize the behavior of regex. So what I'm doing in the second one is passing in that constant, which just says ignore case when doing matches. So that's just one of the options. Okay? Here's my decimal number regex that I was trying to do last time. Uh, you know, one or more digits followed by a dot followed by zero or more digits. Or uh, zero or more digits followed by a dot followed by one or more digits. And I put embedded white space in there on either side of that vertical bar just to make it more readable. But if I leave with if the white space in the pattern like that, it's it's going to that's going to be part of the pattern. It'll it won't match a number unless there's a white. A, it won't you, this pattern won't work unless there's a space after it. And this one will require space before it. But I pass in that option to ignore white space in the pattern, and then uh, I can put white space all I want in to make it format better. Notice I use the at sign up there. Now this will match an entire line. It's the same pattern as up there, but I begin it with the care of in it with the dollar sign. So that matches an entire line of input up to, up to a new line. What other difference do you see there? What's the difference between this pattern, ignore the, the beginning and the end, but between this and the thing above it? You have to escape your escape character. Right, that's what it looks like when you have to put in the escape the escapes. Right? Up there I use the add sign, here I didn't. So you can see the at sign is kind of a nice thing. Incidentally, if you need a double quote, if you need a quote symbol in your pattern, if you're using at sign, you have to do quote, quote, two quotes in a row equal one quote. Okay? Here I'm using an option called multi-line. So this puts the regex in multi-line mode, which changes the meaning of caret and dollar sign to mean beginning of the entire string and the end of the entire string versus beginning of a line into a line. So you've got that mode. All right, let's see some, uh, let's see some code in action here. Okay, the first one up there says, does a string contain a match? So I am going to do r3.isMatch against that string right there. So what do you think the answer should be? What was r3? Decimal number. Does that string contain decimal numbers? Let's run it and see. There it is. Test one return true. Okay? So again, I emphasize that 
we're asking, does this thing contain somewhere within it a decimal number? And it does. Okay? Um, what do you suppose is happening in the next line? It says find the first match. So what do you suppose this does? Well, I keep doing that, you can't see the highlight. So uh, it says find the first match. So up there I call is match. Here I'm calling match. So let's see, r3.match returns a match object, which we then print out. So what do you suppose, what would be a reasonable thing for that match object to do? Yeah? Uh, 22.5 is it matches the first. Right, so it'll tell you what the match is. So if I, if I run that program again, you can see it printed out 22.5. That was the first match. So it's telling you what the match is. <laughs> okay, let's look at test three. We're doing r4.match against that string right there and asking, is that a match? And why is it going to say false in that case? What was different about, let's go look at r4 here. What was different about r4? We're doing an entire line. Or he wants to match an entire line. And so that's not an entire line, that's, that's a number. But this next one is. So this, this would return false because it's trying to match the entire line. This would return true because the entire line is a number. And this would actually print out the match as opposed to true or false. This is test five here. All right, and this is just more stuff with new lines, you know, with different regexes. Let me come down to something more interesting. Right here it says find all the matches. So what does matches return? It returns a collection. Okay, let's look and see. It's a match collection. And match collection implements the iNeural interface, which means you can iterate over it. So we're just iterating over all the matches. So what should be printed out when we run that program? Each time through, you get the next match. Yeah, first time, 22.5, then 36.7, then 0.777. Yeah, so you can loop over like that. And test 10 is sort of the same thing with the different regex. We're just looping over matches. Test 11 splits the string into tokens. So you're basically saying use R3 to split the token. So let's run it and see. So that's test 11. So it, it turned it into the tokens 1, 22.52, 2, 36.73, 0.777, 4. I think there, there may be some space tokens in there somewhere. But that's the, that's the method that I use to split the input into tokens for the... For the Formula class. I thought that the R3 was, wouldn't it only, I thought it would only plot the tokens that match that expression. Let's see. Yeah, so R3 was, would match that. Okay. Why is it pulling out one though? Because it doesn't Because it's, it's, it's doing a split, not a match. So it's basically considering, uh, it matches the token. It, it tokenizes it by giving you the stuff before and between the things that match the regular expression. So yeah, it's going to give you the 22.5, the 36.7, and the 0.777, but it's also going to give you the things before in between them. It just breaks the entire string up into, into tokens. Okay, here's one. R3.replace. What do you suppose that does? So it's r3.replace, so it's using that decimal number pattern, and it gives a string, and the, the last parameter is hash, hash sign. Anyone want to speculate what test 12 does? Replaces 22.5, Yeah, so it basically, you see test 12 there, it replaces, every, every match it replaces with what you told to match it with. All right. Look at this one. Capitalize the first letter of each match. So this is a different version of replace that takes, instead of taking a string as a parameter, it's taking a delegate. And what does that delegate do? So that delegate has to take a match as a parameter. That's why I used M. So what do you think, that, what does that thing do when you give it a match? It takes the match, extracts the string from it, inverts the string to uppercase. So what that's going to do is, 
It's going to replace everything that matches the token, which I forget which matches the token. It's going to replace it with the result of applying that delegate to the match. So let's run it. What was that? Test 13. So you can see it, it, it had lowercase x, now it's uppercase x23 and uppercase hello. So we wrote a little delegate to customize what the replacement was. Okay, look at this one. So we're using replace, but we're replacing everything with dollar one. So it would seem that everywhere it finds something that matches R6, it would throw in dollar one. Well, let's look at R6. Where is R6? Right there. See, R6 says lowercase or a letter followed by zero or more letters and digits. <coughs> okay? So what? I'll tell you what dollar one means. So parentheses are used for grouping in regular expressions. But every time you use a set of parentheses, that's also known as a matching group. And you can refer to the part of the input that was matched by the part of the expression in parentheses. So when we match against x23, which part of x23 will be matched by uh, the first part, the a through z? Let me get this down here where I can point. So there's the x23, and that's matched by the regex. Which part will be matched by this part of the regex, and which part will be matched by this grouped part? 23. Yeah? X will be matched by the first part of the 23. Right. X will be matched by this, and 23 will match this. Dollar one, in this context, refers to the match of the first capture group. And there's only one capture group here, it's this set of parentheses. So it's going to replace every token that it finds with, with what? What's dollar one going to be when we match x23? 23. So it's going to replace x23 with 3. It's going to replace hello with ELLO. -L -L it's throwing away the character. So that's an example of a matching group. And here, this last example is another example of a matching group. So I'm matching R6, I'm looping through all the matches, and each time through I write out the value of matching group 1. So if I run it, okay, there's the result of stripping off the first character of each match, and this is the result of printing out the result of stripping off the first character. So I know you're sitting there thinking, man, that's a lot of... A lot of detail. And it is. But let me tell you the value of it. Once you learn to use regular expressions, you won't go back to not using them. You'll be surprised how many times it's your true advantage to use them. And it's one thing to know regular expressions exist. It's another thing to understand what kinds of things you can do with them in programs. So right now, if I gave you a test, you'd all, most of you probably fail miserably if I asked you to write code based on what I just showed you. But at least you know that regular expressions are a thing, and you know that you can do things like see if there's a match, and iterate through the matches, and edit the things you're matching, and replace the things you're matching, and extract the things you're matching. And as long as you understand that, it's easy to, to, when you need to do it, you just Google and you say C sharp, iterate through matches of regular expression, and, and you see how to do it, you go, oh yeah, that was how you did it. Now, if you can't ask the question, if you don't know what's possible, you're not going to make use of it. But if you know what's possible, you can always figure out how to do it later. Okay? So, um, you all benefit from incorporating regular expressions into your programming repertoire. You won't get a whole lot of practice in this class, but um, I still encourage you to use it. Okay, let's take a break and we'll look at something different.
All right, so why is it so hot in here? It's just me. It's what? I, you know, I taught, I taught 4150 this morning and it was just as hot. It's just depressing. Okay. <laughs> We're going to talk about inheritance now. So this ought to be a familiar topic to you because you learned about object-oriented programming in Java at least. And in C Sharp it's a lot the same, but there's some differences. Furthermore, I find that students, even if they've taken 1410 and 2420, um, a lot of times they don't things that surprise them about inheritance, even though it's the same here as in Java. So we, I want to make sure we're all on the same page with how, how inheritance works, because we'll be using these concepts beginning with PS5 once we get into the spreadsheet. So fundamentally, inheritance looks like this in, in C Sharp. So I'm going to use B to stand for the base class. That's the thing that's being inherited from and D to stand for the derived class, the thing doing the inheriting. And so, whereas in Java you would say class D extends B, uh, C sharp borrows, borrows the syntax from C++ and uses a colon. So you see class D colon B. Now just like in Java, you can only inherit from, extend, one class. You can, there are also interfaces and you can implement as many interfaces as you wish. And if you have interfaces, you just add them. You use interfaces the same way, colon followed by interface name. You, set, you have multiple interfaces separated with commas. All right. So what do you get when you do that? What, do you, what does your program have that it didn't have before when you, when you create that class D? Yeah? All the methods from class D. Well, you're inheriting the, the non-private methods in class D, that's correct. But in terms of writing your program, you now have a new type, right? You've got a class D that behaves a lot like the class B. Uh, furthermore, you get this subtype relationship between B and D. So by subtype, I mean a D is a kind of B. And so anywhere a B is expected, you can supply a D. So if you have an object of type B, if you, have a, if you have an object of type D and you have a variable of type B, you can store the D in it. If a method expects a B as a parameter, you can pass that object of type D as the parameter. And why does that work from a programming language standpoint? Why is it safe to have a variable that's declared to be of type B, but it contains an object that's not? It's an object of type D. So what, what am I getting at? What's, what, what's, what possible question is there? What do I mean by safety? Why is it safe to use a, an object D? And, yeah. You just guarantee that it has like certain methods or certain variables right. and stuff like that. What can you do to an object of type B? There are certain methods you can call on it because it's an object of type B. Well, the D object has all those methods, possibly more, but it's guaranteed not to have fewer. It's got to have all the ones that are public or private. I mean, sorry, public or private. Well, in this case, all that matters is public. So anything you can do to a B object, you can do to a D object. Not vice versa. But. All right, so that's why it's safe to do this substitution. So that's basic inheritance. All right, now when you declare a method, you can declare it public, protected, or private. And there are actually a few other options that I won't get into. In C Sharp, you can read about them. And what's the difference? Public, protected, private. Public and one can access protected is restricted to the subtypes and the type, and private is only in that certain. Okay. Place. So the public ones can be used anywhere. So we can, if we have an object like this, D, we can use D.F anywhere. We can call D.F anywhere. We can call D.G. Uh, well, besides that class right there. We can use it inside of that class. So the the, uh, the protected ones are inherited, but they're uh, only usable inside the classes. They're not usable outside the class, and you can't use D.H anywhere outside of the. Uh, yeah. 
Is that the same way of saying, so if it's protected in B, it then becomes it's like private in D? No, it's still protected in D. So if it's protected in D, if it's protected in B, you're inherited, it's protected in D, which means that if some class extends D, it will inherit that protected. So what's the point of a protected method? Why would you create a protected method? Why not just make them all public and private? Yeah? It would be a helper method used by other methods that are meant to be public in the class. Okay, so it's a helper method meant to be used by other methods. Uh, why not make it private? Yeah? Um, so you can access it from other classes. It has a different scope compared to the private. Well, you can access it from the derived class. The bottom line is you usually make a method public because uh, protected because you are expecting a derived class to override it. Uh, you can make it protected with the intention that it's going to be used in a derived class. But you also make it protected with the so that it's uh, as opposed to private so that it can be overridden in the derived class and change something. So when you design a class to use with inheritance, you've got this public interface that's, designed, that's intended for the whole wide world to use. Then you have these additional protected methods that are intended for use only in derived classes. And usually what the derived class is going to do with that method is override. So it's, when you create a protected method, you're designing in a way for uh, override, for an, you're sort of directing the attention of the designer of the right class at things they might want to override. Instance variables. Are instance variables inherited? So here I've got private int x, private int y. Yeah? Um, derived classes, they cannot use private. And, and oh, yeah, derived classes can use private. You see that right there, I've got private int y. Okay. We know that, ver that, that methods are inherited. What about variables? <coughs> Got an opinion? Yeah. I'm just going to go 50 50 and say yes. Okay. He said, he said yes. Well, does it matter if they're declared public, private, protected? All right, so if a variable is declared, declared private, like x, you can't access x over here. If it's declared protected, you can. But instance variables should already be private anyway. So don't create any instance variables. And this is controversial, and not everyone agrees with me, but instance variables should never be protected or private. I mean, should neither, neither be protected or public. They should be private. But that doesn't mean they're not inherited in a sense. Because here's a picture of a D object. A D object contains a reference to its class. And of course, it contains a place to store the value of Y. But it also has to contain a place to store the value of X. And why is that? Right. It's inheriting methods from this class that need to use X. Those methods are going to expect to find X in the objects they're invoked on. So if you invoke an inherited method from over there, now it's a D method. You have a D object to run that method on it. Where is it going to find the X if the X isn't in the object? So yeah. Um, any D object is going to contain all the variables. All those private variables are going to be in it. Now, the inherited methods, are they going to be able to access this Y right here? No, those inherited methods were written without any knowledge of Y, so they're not even going to mention Y. Methods that are written over here will be able to access y, but they won't be able to directly access x, unless they invoke a method that was inherited. So when a method that was inherited from over there runs, it runs on this object. It, it essentially doesn't even know this part of the object exists. It only it basically plays with this part. And that's, how it, that's how it works in practice. So you don't have to recompile the method you inherit. They just expect, okay, right after the class reference comes X, and then there's nothing in it. That's from their point of view. Um, a method that's written over here will know about, will know that after the class reference, there's this thing which I can't get at, and then the Y that I do care about. 
So the object contains all the, all the variables. And we've discussed protecting so I'll pass on this slide. All right, here's how you do, uh, how you override a method in C-sharp. First of all, if you want a method to be overridable, you have to declare it virtual. This is unlike Java. In effect, in Java, every method is by default virtual. In C-sharp, you have to say, this is a method that I want to allow to be overridable. So you declare it virtual. Then, when we override it, we have to say, yes, I, I am overriding F. You have to put that keyword in front. So it has to come in the pair. It has to be declared virtual in the base class. It has to be declared override in the drive class. So why do you suppose that's the rule? First of all, why the override? Why make someone say, yeah, I'm overriding the method? Well, of course you're overriding it. It's declared virtual, and you're redeclaring it, so it's, you're overriding. What's the value? Yeah? It avoids ambiguity so that the compiler knows exactly which method to call. Well, if we left out the override, I think it would still be able to say, okay, that, that F is inherited from here. That method is virtual. Therefore, it's being override. overridden. It's, it's not for the benefit of the compiler. Yeah? Uh, if you want to adjust the functionality to be more specific to the um, subclass, yeah, well, that's why you override in the first place. But why you require the keyword? Java doesn't make you put that keyword in. Yeah. Is it so that you realize when you're doing it? Right. It's the same thing with out parameters. It's so that you can't override something by accident. Maybe you, uh, you inherit from that class. You don't even know there's an F method in there. You decide you need a method. You're going to call it F. All right? So you write it. In Java, you've just overridden the F method. Uh, in in C sharp, you'll get a compiler error. It'll say, you can't do this. You can't declare a new F unless you want to override it. So it forces you to, you know, to acknowledge that you know you're overriding. So it just prevents mistakes on by programmers. It rules out a class of bugs. OK, so we create a new D, store it in a variable of type D. Then we take that object and store it in a variable of type B. And then we create a new D object and store it in a, in a second variable of type B. So we've got three objects around, or we've got two objects. One object is stored in two variables, D and D1. The other is just stored in D2. So what happens when you call D.F? Well, you see what happens. Okay? I want you to check that this, this fits with what you understand. If we run D.F, it runs the yellow overridden version of F, not the original version. Why? What is it about this that causes the original, I mean, the, the new version of F to be used? What up here determined that? What determines it? Yeah. Say again? The type. Right here? Yes. Okay, then let me do this. If we do B1.F, it still runs the yellow version. B1 has type B. Nevertheless, it runs the yellow version. So what up here is determining which version is run? The original version or the overridden version? Yeah? It's the type of the object that the variable is referencing. Right, it's this. It's the actual type of the object. Remember, every object carries a reference to its class. So at runtime, you can tell what the type of the object is. So it doesn't matter where the, what type of variable the object is stored in. All that matters is what constructor was it created with. So this object here is an object of type D. It was created with a D constructor. It's stored in a D variable. We store the same object in a B1 variable. It doesn't change its stripes. It still behaves the same way. So what happens when you call uh, D.F just depends on what type of object is stored in D. Now, when we call B2.F, why is the white version called? Because that's a B object. Okay? So this is called dynamic binding. So you can look at a program on paper and look at a situation. Imagine that. Some, some, you have a variable of type D, 
and there's a conditional, and sometimes it stores a, an object of type D, and sometimes it stores an object of type B. Maybe it flips a coin, a random number generator decides which object to create. You can't tell, you can't look at the code and say with certainty when the F method is called, which version is, is invoked. It just depends which object is sitting around at runtime. So it's not until runtime that the decision is made which method to call. And what that means in reality is when you call invoke a method on an object, what it has to do is go to the object, find that reference to the class, go to the class, the class will contain, ref will contain a list of methods, and you find, you find the method from the class. So it just depends. If the object points to a different class, you're going to get a different set of methods over there. So that's dynamic binding. Okay. From inside an overridden thing. So essentially, from inside of D, you can refer to base.f. So you can, inside of the D class, refer to the white version of f, the original version of f. You say base.f. What was it in Java? Super. Super. Right. So this is a different keyword here. Right? Here's a thing you can do in C sharp that you can't do in Java. Furthermore, it's a bad idea and you should never do it. Okay? It's called hiding. So f is a non-virtual function, a method, meaning it was never meant, it's not meant to be overridden. It's not allowed to override it. So if you just declare a new method f, the compiler will complain. If you put the keyword new in front of it, they'll say, okay, I guess you really want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nevertheless, this is not overriding. Okay? Now, let's see what happens. Same example as before. D.f is going to run the yellow version. But this time, when you call a non-virtual function, the, the one that you're calling is determined by the variable, not the object. So when we call d.f, f is non-virtual, so it's going to call the version from d. What's going to happen when we call b1.f? It's going to call the version from uh, b, because the variables of type b. All right, and that's different. Under, over, under overriding, this would have called the yellow method. So this is called static binding. The method that gets invoked is known at compile time. Calling static methods is more efficient because the compiler can know in advance which me method is being called. You don't have to follow these pointers through the object to the class to find the function to call, to find the method to call. You just, uh, it's known to compile them. But what's weird about this? Why do I say it's something you shouldn't do? Now you have two methods in F, and it's, it's just odd and confusing. Yeah, you've got one object here. And its behavior depends on where it's sitting right now. Imagine you had a car like that. You had a car that behaved one way when you parked it in a, in a, a spot in the, in, the, in the parking lot, and another, another way when you parked it in a U spot. It just, its behavior changed depending on where it was parked. You don't expect objects to work that way, real objects or objects on, in a programming language. So why do you suppose they put this in? Why do they have virtual at all? Why not just make everything virtual, everything overridable? Yeah? To prevent um, like performance loss by having to have too many pointers to run over the place? Yeah, it's for performance. So the reason methods aren't virtual by default in C-sharp is because if you do not intend a method to be overridden, why pay the overhead of having a virtual function? Just make it non-virtual, and then uh, the method call works more efficiently. So that's fine. So you get a, you know, a couple of instructions less every time you call the method. So I see that. Okay? If it's not virtual, you certainly can't override it anymore. And so there's this sort of, this is the thing I object to, this weird thing that lets you not override it, but replace F, but only in certain contexts. Just, it just strikes me as a bad idea. I'm sure there's probably a good reason for it, but I don't think it's a good feature. So. Yeah? Is that going to cost more memory? Um. No. No, it's, virtual functions cost a little extra memory and cost a little extra time at, at runtime. 
I don't have any problem with non-virtuals. It's the new that I object to. It's just, it, it just counterintuitive the way it behaves. Yeah? Would you put a question like this on the exam and then ask, like, why is it a bad idea? <laughs> I, no, I, I haven't told you enough why it's a bad idea, but I, what I might put on an exam is something like this. To make sure you understand the difference between overriding and this new thing, hiding. Overriding and hiding. And this is a discussion we just had. Yeah. C, C++ is the same way. You, if you want a, a method to be overridable, you have to declare it as such. And it's just there because they're worried about efficiency. And, um, you know, in some cases that matters. A couple extra instructions to call a simple method is a big penalty to pay if you do that a lot. And if, you're, if your application is time critical, you, know, you need to be able to have to make these engineering decisions. Java doesn't let you make those decisions, but you, in C sharp, in C plus, in C sharp, you can craft things in a way you can't in Java. So you just have to understand your tools. All right, constructors. Every class has to have a constructor, and if there's not one, you get one for free. It's a zero parameter constructor that's provided by the compiler. That basically does nothing. On the other hand, if you provide a constructor, you won't get the default one. Um, the first thing a constructor of type D goes, so if you have a, destructor in, a constructor in class D, the first thing it does is call a constructor on the base class. So why does it need to do that? So this is an object. We saw it before. This is an object of type D. What's the D constructor? If it's got initial, the constructor initializes variables. Which variables can the D constructor initialize? Only Y. Only Y. It can't talk about X. So we have to call the base class constructor so we can deal with those variables that the D class can't access. So we call the base class constructor. It initializes this. Then we get a chance to initialize our variables. And it has to be in that order. It has to be the first thing that's done. So there is an example. So I have two constructors in that class and two constructors over here. So that first one takes no parameters, calls the base class constructor, and then does whatever it wants to do. The second one takes two parameters, and it calls the one parameter base class constructor over here uh, that way. So you can see that looks different from Java. So the, the call to the base class constructor comes after the colon and before you get into the body of the constructor. So that's kind of weird looking. Yeah. Uh, this is something I tried to do on the last assignment. Is there a way to use the constructor? Like, let's pretend that there's only B. Mm -hmm. Could you call the empty constructor yeah. inside of the int n constructor? Yes. In Java, the way you would do it is this right. with empty parentheses. And I think it's the same as C sharp, although I can't swear to it. Is it the same? I don't think so. I tried to do that. Does it work? I'm sure there's a way. I know I've done it, but I, right now I'm drawing a blank. It's fine. Okay? Um, now, what would happen if we leave out that colon base in that first constructor up there? We just said D parenthesis and then body of constructor. Oh, it won't be an error. So if you, in fact, in either of these cases, if you leave out the call to the base class constructor, the compiler puts one in for you to the zero argument constructor in the base class. You only get an error if there's not a zero argument constructor. That's why a lot of times you write a derived class, you don't bother calling the base class constructor because it's called automatically for you. You know, any class you write is extending object, if nothing else, and the object constructor is called automatically for you because there's a zero argument object constructor. Okay, abstract classes. PS5 will feature a big abstract class that you've got to implement. So what's the difference between an abstract class, such as B here, and a non-abstract class? Yep? An abstract class, you don't need to define the methods. Okay, so in an abstract class, you can have abstract methods. An abstract method doesn't have an implementation. So it sort of combines aspects of classes and interfaces. 
So what I will do, the, the, I'll give you a class called Abstract Spreadsheet, and you'll have to inherit from it and implement the abstract methods. Why structure a program that way? Yeah? You can implement some of the methods. Okay. So I want to implement, so I'm giving you, I'm, I'm helping you out. I could just say implement a spreadsheet class with these methods. But I want to be able to help you out, so I provide some of the methods. Now, as it turns out, um, you know, and, and the ones I want you to implement, I make abstract. As it turns out, my abstract class has no instance variables. So the methods that I implement can't use instance variables. So what can those methods do? So I've given you a class. I'm probably giving you some methods, and I'm giving you some virtual methods, some, some abstract methods, but no instance variables. So what can my implemented methods do with no instance variables? What's the point? You can inherit it. Well, they'll be inherited, but they won't be. But what code can they contain? Yeah? Is it so that we have to write it? Well, that's why, yeah, I'm, do that's why I'm doing it that way. But what, when, I, when I stick code into my virtual, into my abstract methods, not my methods, like G here, what code is in G? I'm calling the abstract method. So essentially, the strategy is, this is a very common strategy, you write a class, make it abstract, you write some methods that you like that call virtual methods, not virtual, keep abstract methods. And so they won't work until you actually provide an implementation of f in the derived class. But then suddenly these methods that were written to call the abstract methods will work and do something interesting. And of course, they don't, don't just call them directly. It may there'll be some conditionals and some loops or something like that. You'll see what I mean when you see the class. So to implement an abstract method, you just you overwrite it. An abstract method is automatically virtual. So it's a very common pattern that you see. Okay? Then there are interfaces, just like in Java. So D over there extends B, inherits from B, and implements I. Any method declared in an interface is automatically abstract. So you override when you implement it in a class. Otherwise, this, is, this works just like Java. Interface methods, calling a method. So when we call the method G on an object of type D, that's even less efficient than a virtual method. Calling a method through an interface is even slower than calling, just calling a, directly calling a virtual method. Just, I'm just saying. I'm not saying not to use it. Uh, Interfaces, but it's just another performance hit. Okay, so let's quickly look at a code example that I have here, and then we can go out where it's cooler. Okay, let's look at these classes here. I've got to find the right one. Okay, I've got an abstract class called Animal. Um, every animal has a, a name property, and the animal constructor just takes the name and saves it. Every animal needs to know how to speak, but I don't know how, an, how, a, gen, how a generic animal speaks, so I leave that method abstract. Okay? So when someone extends this class, they're going to have to say how that thing speaks. Also, every animal can shout. <coughs> And I know how every animal shouts. It's, ever, it's however they speak converted to uppercase. <laughs> so this is an example where I have, I, I have already made my mind up about shout. I didn't even make it virtual. I, I want to be sure that animals shout in uppercase. And the way I do that is I call this abstract method, which doesn't exist at the moment, and then I do two upper. So this can't be overridden. It uses a method that doesn't exist yet, but... It can't be called. We can't use this class until, you know, you can't directly use this class anyway. So when we override the dog class, and we use the dog class and implement speak, then shout will work off automatically. Okay, here's a virtual property. So leg count. It's hardwired to return four. Leg count's four, but it can be overridden because it's virtual. Here's a virtual method that, uh, again, uses an abstract method. It's just, you say, I want it to speak four times. It just concatenate speak four times. 
Again, it's calling a method yet to be written. All right, here's our dog. You'll see we want to create a dog of a given name and breed, so we call the base class constructor to set the name, and we record the breed. So there's what the constructor does. Uh, we had to add the breed method, because that does, that's just a new thing. Here we're overriding the speak method. So now if you call, what will happen when you call shout on a dog? Woof, woof, yeah, in all caps. Okay. Here I'm just showing you I can override speak repeatedly by calling, you know, it involves, basically I'm, I'm changing the behavior when n is less than or equal to zero here. Before it threw an exception, here it's going to return an empty string and otherwise it will call speak repeatedly. So that's just showing you how to call the, the, an overridden method. Let's see about spider. Some spiders are poisonous, so I have a poisonous property. I still got to call the base class constructor to record the name. Here is the poisonous property, and here's leg count. I'm overriding leg count and saying the spider has eight legs. And then I'm putting this keyword in, yet another new keyword, sealed. So what does it say that means? It sort of cancels. When you override a virtual method, the overridden method is still virtual and can be overridden in another class, unless you seal it. So this is saying, no, spiders have eight legs, yes. And you know, if you extend it to a tarantula class, you can't decide that spiders that are tarantula, are spiders tarantula, or tarantula spiders? Yes. You can't decide they have seven legs, so it's fixed for all time. And we override speak, and I override shout by pending exclamation mark. But I, I wanted to override it, but what happens? <coughs> if, I, if I leave that out, it's going to say, attempt to override the non-virtual shout. So if I say, OK, let's override it, it's going to say, attempt to override the non-virtual shout. So then you say, well, what if I say new? And now the compiler's happy, and you go on with your business, but I really don't like that. <laughs> because the spider is going to shout differently depending on what type of variable it's stored in. When it's stored in a spider variable, it'll shout one way. You store it in an animal variable, it'll shout a different way. That's not how the world works, so I enjoy that. Uh, more of the same there. Finally, that's sort of a, a minimalist phone is a speaker. Um, it's not an animal. Remember, speaker was an interface up here. So. I'll just make this point and then be done. Sorry about having to scroll at the top. There's the speaker interface. And an animal also implemented the speaker interface. Yep. But actually, if you got a question, I know we're all cooking here. Uh, come up and ask me. The rest of you can leave.